Nuclear weapons have been a contentious topic in diplomacy, to say the least. Ever since their arrival at the end of World War II, there have been efforts between various nations of the world to acquire them or halt others from acquiring them. Once nations outside of the two Cold War superpowers of the United States and Soviet Union began acquiring weapons, it quickly became a concern to limit their spread. On the one hand, there were selfish reasons for this. Why let your enemies acquire a nuclear bomb that could help even the playing field? On the other hand, there were other possibly legitimate concerns on what if a more irrational nation acquired one of them, like a crazy dictator. So in 1968, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was created. In the treaty, it basically said that the cat was out of the bag for the nuclear powers that already existed, that being the United States, United Kingdom, France, Soviet Union, and China. But at the very least, there should be a pledge for other nations to never develop their own arsenal. On a diplomatic level, this is probably the best that could be realistically achieved. The US and Soviet Union, while willing to reduce their stockpiles, were never going to fully give up their weapons due to mistrust of each other. And if they wouldn't give up their weapons, the other three certainly wouldn't. So one view is that this is trying to stop the spread, which is a good thing. But for many potential powers among developing countries, this was seen as an insulting double standard. The big countries that bully everyone else gets to keep their nuclear weapons, but the little guy couldn't get their own nukes to defend themselves? As a result, many developing countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia refused to sign the treaty, at least right away. Many of these nations were absolutely determined to get nuclear weapons of their own, if not for their own protection from invasion, also for the chance of being taken more seriously by the major powers. Already just in the few years before the Non-Proliferation Treaty came out, India had started its nuclear weapons program. There were also suspicions that Israel was close to acquiring the bomb as well, although Israel's position was officially one of neither confirming nor denying the existence of such a thing. And yeah, those two are countries where you could easily see being interested in developing nuclear weapons. They're emerging powers surrounded by nations that are hostile to them. But another country unexpectedly began its own nuclear program in 1967, just a year before the treaty. South Africa. No, not that South Africa. That South Africa. Getting into the history of South African politics could be a video on its own, but to sum it up, the current South Africa with this flag and associated with Nelson Mandela emerged in 1994 with the end of apartheid, a horrible racial segregation system in South Africa that had been in place since the late 1940s. While South Africa before 1994 is technically the same nation as after 1994 on paper, they were very different otherwise, with a different flag, different government, different political ambitions, and even a different constitution. Wait, so I guess that does mean they actually are literally different on paper, huh. Either way, while the idea of South Africa with nuclear weapons may seem strange today, knowing that it's the Cold War era South Africa, it begins to make a little more sense when you consider its situation. South Africa was one of the British Empire's Dominion colonies, areas that were allowed to have a form of self-rule within the British Empire. Under the Statute of Westminster in 1931 and the later Status of the Union Act in 1934, South Africa became fully independent. But it still of course had a natural link to the West, siding with the Allies in World War II. This meant that during the Cold War, South Africa was a potentially useful ally for the United States in trying to prevent the spread of communism into Africa. This led to America sharing some atomic materials in the 1950s under the Atoms for Peace program. There was an optimistic idea that perhaps nuclear research could be delegated for peaceful purposes, like underground mining or nuclear energy. In 1957, the US agreed to send to South Africa a nuclear reactor named Safari-1 along with a supply of highly enriched uranium. It arrived in 1965 and was established at a new facility named Pilindaba, just a bit west of Pretoria. The South Africans themselves built a second reactor on the site that would be named Safari-2 in 1967, with the hopes of pursuing the capabilities to work with plutonium. Later that same year, they began their attempts to enrich uranium, thusly beginning the South African nuclear program. While South Africa was still over a decade away from acquiring nuclear weapons, and wasn't even considering going past nuclear energy at first, within a few years they would begin their pursuit. While South Africa had a local supply of uranium ore, they did realize that if they wanted a serious nuclear program, they would need some collaboration with other countries besides the United States. 
Aside from the United States donating a reactor, there were three nations that would share resources or research in such a way that would end up helping South Africa's nuclear program and lead to their eventual development of nuclear weapons. First, in 1969, scientists from South Africa and Pakistan teamed up to experiment and study aerodynamic nozzle enrichment, basically an easier way to enrich uranium for the nuclear process. With both countries prepared to use the method for their own nuclear programs, although Pakistan's wouldn't begin until the 1970s, South Africa could begin. Then France began a relationship similar to the United States by beginning to donate reactors to the Coburg Nuclear Power Station. Then by the 1970s, the anti-apartheid movement was beginning to grow considerably, and boycotts were starting to make it not only more difficult for South Africa's economy, but more difficult for further nuclear diplomacy with most major Western powers. This led to South Africa signing a secret defense pact with Israel in 1975 that involved collaborating in defensive technology. South Africa's growing feeling of isolation also hurried their own efforts, and soon they were prepared for a nuclear test detonation. In 1977, there was a construction of an atomic testing site at the Vostrop airfield in the Kalahari Desert, where South Africa planned to conduct a cold test, meaning a nuclear weapon test where there would hopefully be no yield. Being able to therefore test the mechanics of the bomb, but hopefully avoid a little bit of contamination and detection. But this test never happened due to being detected anyway by other nations. Soviet intelligence learned about the site, and they alerted the United States. And once the United States confirmed the test site was real with a spy plane, both nations were convinced that South Africa was going to test nuclear weapons, and decided to put diplomatic pressure on them to, well, not do that. France even threatened to stop sharing nuclear power reactors with South Africa. As a result, South Africa canceled the test, but that didn't mean they weren't going to try again later. Two years later, South Africa would possibly be involved with a nuclear test that even to this day isn't fully understood. On September 22, 1979, an unidentified double flash of light was detected by an American satellite a short distance from the South African-owned Prince Edward Islands. The double flash of light was a common result of nuclear tests that were often picked up by satellites, and due to the location being so close to South African territory, most people assumed that this was an attempt at a secret South African nuclear test. There were attempts to use underwater sonar data or atmospheric sampling data from the estimated fallout region to try and confirm it, and while there was a small amount of fallout iodine-131 in some Tasmanian sheep and a detection of an ionospheric wave in Puerto Rico for the date of the test, it still wasn't really much, so they couldn't 100% remove unreasonable doubt. Nevertheless, with most experts assuming it was a nuclear explosion, there was also suspicion cast on South Africa's defense partner, Israel. As stated before, Israel's official policy is to never confirm or deny if they have any nuclear weapons, but there have been enough leaks from whistleblowers and spies that most nations by this point knew that Israel had some amount of nuclear weapons. But up until now, they hadn't been able to conduct a test, so perhaps this double flash came from an Israeli nuclear test. Or perhaps it was a joint test between Israel and South Africa. Later statements from South African Deputy Foreign Minister Aziz Pahad in 1997 said that there was an exchange of South African uranium being given to Israel in return for nuclear weapon design information and a few supplies to help build them. So collaboration in this test wasn't out of the question. However, in the same statements, he also said that the Vela incident was a South African test, but then later his press secretary claimed that he was misquoted and that he was only acknowledging the rumors and supporting an investigation into them. While suspicions still rest on it being an Israeli-South African test, we still do not know the full story to this day. But if it is true, this would be South Africa's first nuclear test. Whether South Africa conducted the Vela incident test or not, South Africa did end up building a small arsenal of six nuclear bombs, with a seventh on the way before the program ended. While South Africa did grow diplomatically isolated due to anti-apartheid protests and embargoes, they were not under any threat of invasion by a major power, so why did South Africa feel the need to build an arsenal? During the middle of the Cold War, there was the common idea of the domino effect theory. If one nation falls to communism, then other nearby nations would soon fall. While this is commonly associated with Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War with Laos and Cambodia, 
There was also a similar belief for Southern Africa held by South Africa. In Rhodesia, there was an ongoing war between their own extreme apartheid-like regime and a united patriotic front. While the PEF was an outright communist, there was heavy Marxist support and influence in their movement, and they also supported the communist side of the Mozambican Civil War that broke out in 1977. Meanwhile, with South Africa's western neighbor, there was a civil war in Angola that broke out in 1975, also with the communist side, including intervention from Cuban military forces. Upon the PF winning in Rhodesia and renaming the country to Zimbabwe, and with the communists having the upper hand in both Angola and Mozambique, it seemed like maybe there could be a domino effect. South Africa hoped that their nuclear bombs would not only act as a deterrent from invasion in case either civil war spilled over, but also as a strategic advantage to perhaps turn the tide of the war, or give them a leg up in future peace negotiations. But ultimately, with South Africa under as much pressure as they already were due to anti-apartheid embargoes, they realized that they couldn't really use them without making that situation potentially much worse. In 1988, an agreement was signed where all foreign players in the Angolan Civil War would leave the country. While the Civil War wasn't over, it did lessen the worry about a domino effect. Mozambique Civil War would also end by the early 90s. Namibia's independence from South Africa being given in 1990 further demonstrated that times were changing. Given that the next few years would see a collapse of the Soviet sphere of influence and many communist efforts around the world, it quickly seemed that their nuclear arsenal would no longer be needed. In 1989, Friedrich Willem de Klerk became president of South Africa and to many people's surprise began tearing down the apartheid system. He legalized political protest against apartheid, he freed Nelson Mandela and other notable imprisoned activists, and then finally he agreed to have free multiracial elections in 1994, the first in South African history. De Klerk also decided to dismantle South Africa's arsenal and cease production of further nuclear weapons in 1989. Then in 1991, South Africa finally signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Nelson Mandela, upon winning the election in 1994, was more than happy to see an end to the nuclear arsenal, as his party's policy was anti-nuclear weapons to begin with. The process of dismantling all South African nuclear bombs was complete three months into Nelson Mandela's term. It was after that, through the new government as well as interviews with de Klerk, where a lot of our information we now know on the history of the nuclear program finally came to light. At least to the public. All of this makes South Africa the only nation in the world to build a nuclear arsenal and then voluntarily dismantle it. I'm Emperor Tigerstar, and I'll see you guys next time.